Hi there, my highly valued, treasured, and esteemed viewers and listeners, and welcome back to your channel of choice. My name is Dr. Nath Arwa. I am a clinical pharmacist by training and by profession, and I am the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants, a premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute, with a difference where patient safety medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here, we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services in your line of duty. So I humbly urge you to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you some precious tips which you may find useful in your line of duty. So I welcome you to part 75 of our pharmacotherapy MCQ series measuring in toxicology. Our first question reads, Master JSL, a five and a half year old boy is rushed to your A&D by his auntie shortly after he ingested a full bottle of ferrous sulfate tablets which belonged to the same auntie. Master JSL was playing with the bottle whose cup is now off. Apparently he has swallowed all its contents and the auntie informs you it was a newly filled prescription. Now the bottle had 30 tablets. So my question to you is which of the lab abnormalities listed below are likely to be observed in the case of Master JSL? Would he be desaturating? Would the SpO2 be below 60? Or would the blood pH exceed 7.45? Would he have a positive anion gap? Or would there be a no smaller gap? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So C is the correct answer. Here we have a case of a positive anion gap. Now we know that acute ion overdose can cause an anion gap metabolic acidosis through the disruption of oxidative phosphorylation and it can also happen via liberation of three hydrogen ions when the ferric ion Fe3 plus combines with water. Ion induced oxidative damage to the GIT, the gastrointestinal tract epithelium, permits increased systemic ion observation and that can be very dangerous. Now, after the total ion binding capacity is exceeded, free ion distributes widely into many tissues and it exerts an oxidative stress and interruption in cellular respiration and that leads to a state of uh, acidosis and not alkalosis. So B becomes wrong. Just like to add that desferioxamine chelates the ferric ions Fe3 plus and not ferrous ions Fe2 plus. Just for your information. Let's move to the next question, please. It reads In patients with acute decompensated heart failure, non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers aren't recommended or preferred. So, my question to you is. Which of the statements listed below explains the reason why? Is it because they cause increased depolarization? Or do they cause decreased cardiac output? Do they reduce remodeling of the myocardium? Or do they protect against sudden cardiac death? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. They aren't preferred because they decrease cardiac output. Now, just like to emphasize that non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers 
have a negative chronotropic effect that means they reduce heart rate they also have a negative inotropic effect meaning they reduce ventricular myocardial contraction therefore decreasing cardiac output without providing any protective benefits by inhibiting say remodeling as seen with beta blockers like to add that deltaism and verapamil do not reduce remodeling of the myocardium neither do they protect against sudden cardiac death in patients with heart failure and uh, I'd just like to remind you of the physiology that blood pressure is cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output is uh, heart rate times stroke volume where stroke volume is uh, most influenced by preload, inotropy, and afterload. So those are things you need to know, even as you select the drugs used in these heart failure patients. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. PTO, a 35-year-old male patient, ingested an unknown amount or number of imipramine tablets about two hours ago, in an attempt to commit suicide. Currently, he has refused to respond to any questions. His 12 fleet EKG or ECG shows a widening QRS interval of about 120 milliseconds. So my question to you is, which of the treatment modalities listed below would you consider the most important for Mr. PTO now now? Would you administer octreotide sandostatin? Would you infuse sodium bicarbonate? Would you administer one ampule of 50% dextrose in water? Or would you administer procainamide? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So I would choose to administer sodium bicarbonate. Now we know that imipramine or tofrane is a tricyclic antidepressant which is known to inhibit sodium channels in the heart at high doses thereby causing QRS widening and ultimately life-threatening cardiac arrhythmias. Therefore, administering sodium bicarbonate via IV infusion is the initial treatment of choice. Now none of the other options would help this situation and uh, procainamide to be specific could even worsen it due to its ability to inhibit sodium channels. I would like to remind you that tricyclic or tricyclic antidepressants uh, antagonize the sodium channels and that can also affect nerve conduction in the central nervous system causing seizures in extreme cases. So be very careful when uh, dealing with such patients. Let's move to the next question, please. The next question reads, Mr. PWT, a middle-aged male patient who is followed up at your rheumatology clinic, has been taking weekly methotrexate for many years. Today, he presents to the clinic with signs and symptoms, which, in the rheumatologist's opinion, are concerning for methotrexate toxicity. So my question to you is, which of the medications listed below would be the most appropriate choice in the management of Mr. PWT's case now? Would it be glucapides? Would it be leucovorin? Would it be edophonium? Or would you choose to administer fomepizol? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. both A and B are correct. So I'd administer both glucapides and leucovorin and I'll tell you why. Glucapides which is marketed as voraxis and leucovorin are treatment options for methotrexate toxicity. Now edophonium marketed as Enlon is a choline esterase inhibitor used as an antidote for neuromuscular blocker toxicity. So yeah, it has no role here. And uh, for mepizol, marketed as antizol, 
or IV ethanol are the antidotes of choice for antifreeze which is ethena, ethylene glyco and uh, methanol toxicity. I'd like to add that leucovarin doesn't need dihydrofolate ductase for it to be activated and it allows normal synthesis of purines and pyrimidines to take place. Now glucapidase or proraxis is an IV or intrathecal enzyme that metabolizes methotrexate quickly and can be administered in patients with methotrexate toxicity. And it has, uh, especially when they've developed a plastic bone which uh, usually has high mortality rates or risks. So all those many words justify why I would opt to administer glucapidase and leucovarin in this particular clinical scenario. Let's move to the next question, please. The next question reads, Mr. WPL, a 77-year-old male patient, has been taking digoxin for the past 19 years to manage his heart failure. Today, he presents to the cardiology clinic complaining of new symptoms which in the cardiologist's opinion imply digoxin toxicity. So my question to you is, which of the symptoms listed below is the most common in digoxin toxicity? Is it seizures, nausea, visual halos, or delirium? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. Nausea it is. B is the correct answer. Now, chronic digoxin toxicity is more common in elderly patients. And uh, nausea is the most common non-cardiac symptom of digoxin toxicity. Uh, I would like to add that visual disturbance and neuropsychiatric manifestations aren't as common as GI symptoms in chronic digoxin toxicity like in this case. And uh, I would like to remind you that neuropsychiatric manifestations with chronic digoxin may include delirium, confusion, and even seizures. Now, the most common non-cardiac symptoms of chronic uh, digoxin toxicity are loss of appetite, abdominal pain, and even nausea. Then uh, the visual disturbances with chronic uh, digoxin so toxicity may include halos around lights. And then I would just like to add that uh, the potassium level is normal to low in chronic digoxin toxicity, whereas potassium levels are usually elevated in acute overdose toxicity. So those are things you should uh, pay attention to when you are managing toxicity in chronic or a short-term use of digoxin. And all those many ones justify why nausea is our best bet in this particular question from that list of four. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Madam LSM, a middle-aged female patient, is rushed to your accident and emergency department by her roommate who saw her ingest a handful of acetaminophen tablets six to seven hours ago. Underline six to seven. Now, the roommate carried the bottle which indicates the product is a sustained release formulation. And uh, LSM's current acetaminophen plasma concentration is currently just below the line showing no hepatic toxicity when plotted on the Rumac Matthew nomogram. So, my question to you is uh, which of the interventions listed below would you recommend for? this clinical scenario for the management of Madam LSM now. Is it true in your opinion that uh, we shouldn't administer n cysteine? Should we begin n cysteine therapy? Should we check the acetaminophen or the paracetamol plasma concentrations at 8 hours because they haven't yet elapsed? Or should we check the acetaminophen or paracetamol plasma concentration at 12 hours? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer.
So both answers B and C are correct. Acetaminophen or paracetamol serum concentrations may not rise with sustained release products until 8 hours after ingestion. So it is common to administer an acetyl system, what we abbreviate as NAC, NAC, even if the level is normal initially. Furthermore, there is little risk in beginning an acetyl system therapy until the second level comes back. So I would be cautious and I would go ahead and administer it because this is a sustained release product. Remember, the peak may delay. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which phase of cardiac action potential within the ventricular myocardium is mainly affected by tricyclic antidepressants, the TCAs, and uh, causes most problems in patients who overdose tricyclic antidepressant. Is it phase 2, 0, 4, or 1? I'll give you 10 seconds to ponder it and choose the right answer. Phase 0 it is. Now the tricyclic antidepressants inhibit cardiac fast sodium channels. That is, uh, they interfere with the inward current i.e. sodium from the outside of the myocyte to the inside thereby making the inside of the cell more positive or less negative and as such there is a slowing of phase zero of the ventricular myocyte depolarization and uh, this results in overall widening of the QRS interval that can lead to what we call malignant ventricular arrhythmias. Be very careful. Now, there are no medications that uh, only target phases 4, 1, or 2 of the action potential in the cardiac myocytes. That's just for your information. Now, I would like to add that uh, beta blockers and calcium channel blockers affect phase 0 by reducing the movement of sodium inside the cell and uh, this depresses the automaticity of the SA and the AV nodes and uh, not the action potentials in the ventricular myocardium. Uh, Verapamil and Diltiazem, on the other hand, inhibit phase 4 of the nodal action potential or automaticity of the SA and the AV nodes by reducing the movement of calcium into the cells and not action potential in the ventricular myocardium as seen with class 1 antiarrhythmics. That's just for your information. And then I would also like to emphasize that beta blockers are considered class 2 antiarrhythmic medications. And the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, which are majorly verapamil and diltiazem in the market, are considered class 4 antiarrhythmic medications. So just remember that, even as you deliver pharmacotherapy. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, which of the statements listed below most accurately describes the mechanism of action of octreotide in an old male patient with the new onset renal failure, which resulted in accumulation of glyburide, uh, sulfonylurea, and elevation of its concentration and eventual severe hypoglycemia. Is it it directly replaces glucose or it blocks glucose uh, stimulated beta cells insulin secretion or it blocks glucagon production from alpha cells or it blocks beta cells in the periphery? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So octreotide actually blocks glucose-stimulated beta cell insulin secretion. And uh, I would just like to repeat myself that octreotide blocks insulin secretion from the beta cells in the pancreas specifically, 
which is uh, being turned on by excessive concentrations of the sulfonylurea, the gliburide to be specific, which is present due to the uh, reduced elimination. Now, I would like just to emphasize that gliburide, which is marketed as glymase, is a sulfonylurea that is 50% cleared or eliminated by the kidneys. Now, patients with acute impairment of renal function can develop sulfonylurea toxicity. So be very careful when you're managing them in patients with AKI or with kidney issues. I'd like to remind you that octetoid is a subcutaneous, semi-synthetic, long-acting analog of somatostatin. And uh, it acts by that mechanism that I mentioned earlier, blocking glucose-stimulated beta cell insulin secretion. And uh, instead of uh, glucose infusion, octetoid can be administered at doses of 50 mics sub Q every six hours to manage such emergencies. Now, you are supposed to monitor the patient for hypoglycemia 24 hours after the last octetoid dose, just to ensure things are in order. Now, some of the common adverse effects of uh, octetoid or sandostatin injection include site pain, injection site pain to be specific, nausea, it can cause bloating, it can cause di diarrhea. So, watch out for those even as you opt to use it in managing overdoses of such sulfonylureas. Let's move to the next question, please. And it reads, Mr. WMP, a middle-aged male hypertensive patient, overdosed israpdipine. And uh, the emergency medicine physician on duty consults you concerning this case. So my question to you is, which of the treatment options listed below would provide an adequate hemodynamic response in this clinical scenario? Would you opt to recommend whole bowel irrigation? Would you recommend the administer atropine? Would you settle for hemodialysis? Or would you advise them to infuse insulin followed by dextrose? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. advise them to infuse insulin followed by dexos. Now, isradipine, which is marketed as Dynasac, D-Y-N-A-C-I-R-C, is an oral dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker with a half-life of around 8 hours. Now, insulin followed by dexos is commonly used in the management of calcium channel blocker overdose. And... Uh, like to underscore the fact that efficacy of atropine use is unknown in calcium channel blocker toxicity and uh, while it can be tried if readily available it generally doesn't work as well as uh, insulin followed by dextrose and uh, patients with calcium channel blocker toxicity are generally good candidates for hemodialysis due to the large volume of distribution of these highly protein-bound calcium channel blockers. So hemodialysis wouldn't be the best option. And then uh, whole bowel irrigation is indicated for ingestion of long-acting or sustained release formulations. And then uh, beneficial effects of insulin plus dextrose have been seen in calcium channel blocker toxicity due to the fact that insulin promotes glucose uptake and carbohydrate metabolism to generate energy during myocardial stress that ensues in such emergencies. And uh, I would like to remind you that when administering insulin plus dextrose in calcium channel blocker toxicity, you're supposed to monitor glucose every 30 minutes and potassium and magnesium every hour until such patients stabilize. So remember those little bits of facts even as you manage such an emergency let's move to the next question please and it reads master wco a 17 year old male patient drunk 
an unknown volume of ethylene glycol antifreeze in an attempt to commit suicide. He is now experiencing abdominal discomfort but not vomiting. Uh, his spouse, he married young, his spouse notified the poison control center at nearby university hospital and they recommended initiating fumepizole therapy via the IV route. So my question to you is which of the statements below is correct with regard to fomepizole? Does it decrease the development of metabolic acidosis? Or does it prevent metabolism of ethylene glycol to formic acid? Or does it completely inhibit alcohol dehydrogenase? Or is it true that it reversibly inhibits aldehyde dehydrogenase. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So for mepizol decreases the development of metabolic acidosis and it also completely inhibits alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, I'd like to emphasize that fomepizole or antizole is a competitive antagonist of alcohol dehydrogenase, which is involved in the metabolism of toxic alcohols, including methanol and even propylene glycol. So that makes uh, those two answers correct, because if it blocks the formation of the acid, then acidosis will be decreased. Let's move to the next slide, please. And it reads, PLT, a middle-aged patient, is rushed to your accident and emergency department following an overdose of nisodipine, which is marketed as Sula. So my question to you is, which of the ECG changes listed below would likely be observed in the case of Mr. PLT? T. Would it be sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, normal sinus rhythm, or a new bundle branch block? I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So both sinus tachycardia and normal sinus rhythm would be observed. Now, I would like to start by saying that normal sinus rhythm and sinus tachycardia are typically seen in patients with dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker toxicity because they lack effect on the nodal action potential within the heart. Now, nisodipine or solar is an oral dihydropyridine pyridine calcium channel blocker. I would like to remind you that sinus bradycardia, PR prolongation, variable AV block, junctional rhythms, bundle branch blocks, and QT prolongation are typically seen in the non-dihydropyridine channel, calcium channel blocker toxicity cases, not in this case. That's just for your information. That rules out answers B, sorry, D and A. Let's move to the next slide, please. And the question reads, Mr. LKO, a middle-aged male patient, is rushed to your accident and emergency department with chest pain. His EKG shows ischemic changes and his lab results are pending. Mr. LKO admits to insulfating cocaine 60 minutes before the chest pain ensued. So my question to you is, which of the following would be the next best course of action in this clinical scenario? Would you administer the joxin at a dose of 0 0.25 milligrams IV? Would you administer 25 milligrams of atenol orally? Would you administer 5 milligrams of metoprolol? IV or would you administer 0.5 milligrams of uh, lorazepam 
IV. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So I would settle for lorazepam at a dose of 0.5 milligrams IV. I'd like to start by reminding you that cocaine-induced chest pain should be managed with benzodiazepines. The administration of beta blockers such as a B uh, may theoretically cause an opposed alpha agonist activity, further worsening coronary vessel spasm, which is behind his chest pain, and that would result in reduced perfusion, thus ischemia, which is behind that pain. Eh? Now, this risk is outweighed by the lack of mortality benefit of acute beta blockade in this population. Thus, the American Heart Association states that beta blockers should be avoided in acute coronary syndromes. I would just like to add that potential alternatives may include, for example, phentolamine, diltiazem, or benzodiazepines in the management of such chest pain. Now, while beta blockers aren't recommended, those with mixed alpha beta blockade characteristics such as cavedilol and labetilol are unproven and are generally considered not to be appropriate in this setting so uh, to be on the safer side administer lorazepam to avoid complications let's move to the next slide please and the question reads mrs mkm a middle-aged female patient is rushed to your accident and emergency department complaining of abdominal pain and nausea. Currently, she takes acetaminophen or paracetamol for pain relief, losartan, and digoxin for her cardiovascular disease. Some of the pertinent labs include blood glucose levels of 82 milligrams per deciliter, sodium is of 140, potassium is 3.2, creatinine is 1.0, and the digoxin levels are 1.5 nanograms per ml. So my question to you is, which of the diagnoses listed below corresponds to MKM's case? This is a case of hypernatremia, digoxin toxicity, diabetes, or hyperkalemia. I'll give you 10 seconds to choose the correct answer. So this is a clear case of digoxin toxicity. Now this patient's potassium uh, levels are low while the other labs are within normal limits. She is presenting with the non-specific symptoms, in my opinion. Now, I'd like to emphasize that low potassium levels can be associated with digoxin toxicity, even when digoxin levels are normal, because, digoxins, because of digoxin's uh, impact on the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. I'd like to remind you and caution you that digoxin has a narrow therapeutic window of 0 0.8 to 2 nanograms per ml. So watch out, monitor the levels and respond swiftly when the levels appear elevated. Now the most common non-cardiac symptoms of digoxin toxicity are for example loss of appetite, abdominal pain and nausea which I talked about earlier. And I would just like to remind you that normal blood glucose levels are anywhere between 70 and 100 milligrams per deciliter whereas the normal serum sodium levels are anywhere between 135 and 145 milliequivalents per liter and uh, those of potassium are 3.5 to 5.5 milliequivalents per liter that's just by the way for your information so my highly esteemed viewers and listeners that brings us to the end of this video now if this video benefited you in any way I would like to remind you to give it a thumbs up and to like it and to share it widely with your peers. And if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. 
I would like to promise you all that the best is yet to come. And I'm very thankful that you made time to view and to listen to this video. I sincerely appreciate your partnership, your continued support, and even your kind collaboration. And I look forward to interacting with you in uh, the next video in our series. Thank you very much.